Okay, so we're in a chapter four um, of C++, so we're going over basic declarations and expressions. So this is going to serve as a foundation. These, the things in here, the, the um, types that we're going to go over are the same in C++, they're the same in Java, they're the same in Python, they're the same everywhere, okay? Yes. Yeah. So, so when we, when you learn this in C++, the great thing about learning C++ is it's the most strict, the most stringent, right? The most difficult. So, so when you, um, when you understand C++, because it is, is not forgiving, um, you, you, you learn it well and you can transfer it into other programming languages. Okay. That's the, that's the theory. Uh, yes. Question. Yeah. Yeah, in a lot of ways, um, the basic the basic structures in all programming languages are similar, like variables. Variables all have a type, right? Whether they say it or not. Like in JavaScript, you don't have to say what type the variable is. You just declare a variable and you can store anything in it. But that comes at a cost, right? So, so when the computer can store any type of data, it has to prepare a space for any type of data, which is inefficient. The reason why C++ or like Java is a little bit faster is that when you say a, a variable is a you know a boolean or a character, it only reserves a tiny amount of memory for that for that uh, variable. So because you're specifying how much memory has to be reserved for these variables, it's more efficient. Okay, so 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 basically the same things are happening under the hood in other programming languages, but you're not really aware of them because the programming language them is doing the programming language is doing it implicitly, which means that it's doing it without your like say so or interaction, which makes it more simple, but you have less control. And it's it's actually kind of hard to understand some of this stuff that goes on in a programming language when it's not explicit. So C and C are great to learn on because everything is explicit. You have to tell the programming language everything and therefore you have to understand what's going on under the hood so you know loops variables if statements right all of those things are just expressed with different you know different commas different you know syntax we call that syntax right different you know different punctuation in different programming languages and different keywords but all the concepts are identical um, yeah so um, the, the main classes of programming language are interpreted and compiled. So like Java, C++, when we compile it, that's a compiled programming language. It means that everything gets turned into machine code like right up front, and then you run that program. Program is, uh, programming languages like Python, JavaScript are called interpreted, and that means that the code that you write waits um, it waits until it's ready to be run, and then the interpreter compiles it kind of on the fly. Okay, there are other kind of other you know, quasi-compiled languages like C Sharp, where they do what's called just-in-time compiling, where basically it kind of compiles like right before it's not technically interpreted. But those are the main classes of programming languages that are compiled and interpreted programming languages. Okay, so so elements of a program so we're gonna we're just gonna go through this as quickly as possible I'm just gonna hit like where I think that you if you read it yourself that you would uh, that you would um, not understand some of the stuff okay so so data code and classes okay so so when um, uh, in C uh, and and previous to C++ C++ is really old and this book is that we're using is really old so like when they talk about Previous programming languages. They're talking about really ancient programming languages like COBOL, C, like, like ones that you wouldn't really even get trained in now. There's still work in those programming languages, but it's mainly legacy code like, um, like ATM machines and like bank software and like stuff like that, you know, that, that doesn't get changed because it's so critical, right? Um, okay, so classes, which we'll discuss later, later, um, those are a combination of data and operations to be performed. Okay, so we have data, that's the stuff we're storing, and code that tells the computer what to do with the stuff we're storing, right? Okay. Okay, elements of a program. So uh, we have basically in, um, in here we have at the top, we have include, so we're including some code, like some libraries of code that we're gonna call later. We have, we're declaring some variables at the top, in C++, we have one, uh, we have one um, function called main, okay? It returns a value of int. So int right here, when we have int main, 
that means that the main function is returning a value of int. So you can consider the function to be of a type, okay? So this is our first introduction to data types. So a, a type of data is basically like an integer, a, um, a decimal, a, a, in this case, not a string. A string is, a, a, most learning languages, a string, a character, a Boolean. It means that, okay, so for a function, the type of the function means the, the type of the data that the function returns, okay? <laughs> A lot of times you see a, a weird word here called void, and void just means that the function doesn't return anything. Okay, one of the things you might notice in C++ that's different than other languages is main cannot be void. Okay, so if you, if you put the type where it says int here as void in C++, that will be an error. C++ must return, must, must be of some type. The main function must be of some type in C++. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have head and comments at the top. Data declarations are next. Then we have a function called main. Okay, the function main has these two uh, parentheses here. Um, oh, you guys can see. My okay, these two parentheses here, right after main, those are where we put in our arguments into the function. Or I'm forgetting the word now. I have a problem with vocabulary. So the the data that's coming to the function goes between the uh, parentheses here, and then the code block. <coughs> Of the uh, main fun of the function called main is here between these curly braces. Okay, notice that we have executable statements, and then we return some value, so return zero. All right. If you have if the main if if the function has any other type other than int or sorry other than void, uh, then you have to return some value. That's just how it works. All right. Now we discovered yesterday that our compiler uh, doesn't give us a, an error if we don't return something, but you should return whatever you declare the, the function is. You should return that type of, of, uh, of value. Okay, so here's our hello world. We have our kind of, this is like our style that we went through before. Um, this technically, you know, there everyone has like, hey, you should comment like this. Hey, you should do this. In, in reality, it's different in every organization. If you go to work for a company, they'll have some standard. You should basically look at the project you're working in and you should follow whatever they're working in. So your code should look like all the other code that's in the project. If you make a new project yourself, it's up to you. You get to decide what, what you're gonna do, right? Uh, yes? Uh, how come it doesn't use the Okay, so in this case, so, uh, so, so the, just like in Java, in C++, it looks for a function named main to run first, right? It just looks for that automatically. It's like part of the language, right? So, and, and main has to have a type. It can't be void, all right? It just because that's like one of the requirements of that one, that one main function, right? The main function in quotes, right? And then, and then by tradition, you return a zero if it has no errors. C++ is often a low language. Often you would, a lot of times in complex systems, you'll have one language calling another. So like in a modern system, you might have Python like running everything, right? Because it's easy to interact with other systems. And that Python might be running Java or C++. Uh, that's kind of faster, right? Okay, there's a lot that, you know, in the modern programming world, it's a lot of like, exotic setups, you know, like with different programming languages and, and databases and whatnot. So, so, but this is that, but for C++, that's, that's what you do. You return for the main function, you return a zero. That way, if everything runs correctly, whatever called it gets a zero back, right? <clears throat> okay. So our operators, you guys are familiar with all these. Well, I didn't line them up very well. Multiply is a star, divide is a, a forward slash. Forward slash, you can tell if you imagine the forward, the slash is a person leaning forward, that's a forward slash. If you imagine the person, the slash is a person with its feet on the ground, right? If they're leaning backwards, it's a backwards slash, right? Okay. Um, that's divide, add is a, a uh, just as you might expect, subtract as a minus. The modulus is something totally different. It's useful, it's useful in programming. You've probably never seen it in math. Basically, a modulus is just another operator, but it returns the remainder. So if you said, if you did like um, 10 modulus 3, you would get a 1. Does that make sense? Okay, so it returns the remainder of a division problem. Okay, so it's like division, but it returns the remainder. All right, it's very, very useful. Like, um, say you want to know how many you know, weeks, you know, if you can, anyway, it's just very useful, the modulus is. Okay, 
precedence rules, just like you have, um, just like you have in math, you have order of operations. There are precedent rules here. So modulus, multiply, divide, modulus have precedence over addition, subtractions, parentheses may be used to group terms. Thus, okay, one plus two times four yields twelve, or one plus two times four yields nine. Okay, so just as you might expect in math, parentheses come first. Parentheses are really great. It, it's a visual way to divide stuff up and make sure people know, other programmers and you in the future know what what order things are in. Okay, there's a problem with the program. We compute the value of the expressions, but we don't know anything about it. If we were constructing a build, think about how confusing a workman would be if we said, take your wheelbarrow back and forth between the truck and the building site. Do you want me to carry the bricks in it? No, just go back and forth. Okay, what What this guy, this author, who's not super funny, unlike myself. You're so funny. Thanks, thanks, bro. <laughs> no. So... So basically, they're computing something, but the value doesn't go anywhere, right? So it's a kind of a pointless operation. They're, they're going one plus two times four, but that value doesn't get stored anywhere. It doesn't do anything. So it's just, it's literally just floating out there doing nothing. Okay. So, so there's no, basically, you're not assigning it anywhere. You're not taking that value and doing anything. So that's what he's saying, like with the wheelbarrow. Hey, you know, hey, you want me to do all this work, but you're not telling me to take it anywhere, right? Okay. All right, um, using standard out output class. So, so C++ is kind of this, it's a lot of console work, you know? So, um, so C++ can do a lot of things. They use it for game development. They use it a lot for application development, like, you know, Microsoft Word, or, you know, uh, they use it for lots of different types of development that have graphical user interfaces or GUIs, right? But a lot of the stuff that you do with C++ also just runs in the terminal. Okay, so standard out, Standard C out, that's basically us printing out back to the terminal. It's useful not just for programs that run, but it also when you're debugging. Like if you're not working in a, in a full like IDE, uh, standard out is a way to uh, for you to get messages back from the program, like to check values of variables, for you to understand how things are running. You know, like say if you want to know if a loop is running or you want to know if some operation worked the way you thought, you can just print out the value of some variable back to the thing, and you can kind of get a window into how things are working. Okay. This says watch the spacing. So you notice that um, that uh, basically there's no spaces around the word. So notice is right here. So is has a space before and after on the top. Is doesn't have a space below. So you can get like unreadable strings. So as you print out like pieces of a string, they're all gonna get smushed together. So you have to count for the spaces is what they're saying. Okay. Okay, variables and storage. Uh, variables are case sensitive. So lowercase sam, Sam with an uppercase S and Sam all uppercase are three different variables. It's absolutely um, case sensitive. A lowercase S and uppercase S are no more similar than an X and an A. They're in that they're not the same character. Okay, so or or a Z for example, or like a P. Okay, I could go on and on. I could go like a, there's like at least twenty six examples. <laughs> okay. Uh, the following example are some variable names, okay? So um, they can be, by convention, variable names are lowercase only. That's a lie. Okay, each variable, name, m variable must be named. This is where one of those things where you, where you hold, I would follow what's put in this book. What I have noticed is that in academic work, many people learn this type of, of variable naming convention first. And so a lot of people still use this variable naming convention. Another one that you learn in Java is camel case, right? Where you start with a lowercase word and then each additional word is uppercase rather than using these underscores. It, it's the same thing. It's personal preference or it's preference of the organization you're working with. So you should follow whatever standard for naming is, is being used in the code you're working in. Okay. Okay. Um, but, um, for our purposes in our book or in our, our class here, please do you follow this book and please do follow this. It's good to just practice following a convention, uh, regardless of what that convention is. It's just good practice. All right. Um, also this brings to the point of variable naming is really important. All right. So, so naming variables, don't start naming variables. I one, I four, I six, P 
P7Q, okay? No one knows what that is, all right? When you come back in five minutes, you won't understand your code. And so name it like something like this. One of the lessons I have learned personally saves me a lot of time. Like if I have something that's talking about a list of dogs, okay? I'd name that variable dogs, okay? When I run through a loop of a list called dogs, I would call each individual thing a dog, right? So a list, you just, you just, mul you just put a, uh, just as you would when you talk, you, anything that's multiple of something is just dogs, uh, and any individual item is just dog, right? So, so if you come up with some reasonable way to name stuff that's not super complicated, but makes sense to you, you know, it's an ongoing thing, and people get better and better at variable naming as they go, okay? But, um, don't use special characters in your variable naming. You can use numbers if you necessary. My opinion, stick to lower and uppercase um, alphabetic alphabet characters, right? English alphabet, and uh, stick to just these underscores are kind of the the unique thing. Use an underscore. Um, it's safe everywhere. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> the following are not variable names, okay? One, it can't begin with a number. That's why I say don't use numbers, okay? Um, the next one down, it contains a dollar sign. It can't contain a dollar sign. That's why I say don't use any special characters. That's the safest bet, all right? It can't contain a space. Variable names can't contain a space. Oh, and this is the, honestly, this is the toughest one. So um, the containing a reserved word is a real problem because you don't know what the reserved words are. Now, a programming language can seem vast. It can seem like there's unlimited number of things. There's not, there's like a hundred. Like there's not, it's not biology where there's a gajillion different kinds of flatworm, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a programming language. Somebody made up all the words and now they're reserved words, right? Now this is where an IDE or something other than a text editor really helps. You know, if you're trying to type in a text editor with no text highlighting, you know where things turn different colors um, in the code, it's a real problem because the reserved words won't highlight for you. Okay, if you use int in R and what we're using, it will just turn a different color and you're like, oh, that doesn't look right. It must be a reserved word. I won't use that. If you stay away from very short stuff or things that, you know, um, yeah, don't call an int, 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 right? Don't name the int, int. Okay. Yes. Yes, you could name it that because it's long. Right. Avoid variable names that are similar. For example, the following illustrates a poor choice of variable names. See, I just said you did, told you to do this, and now that's saying don't do this. I totally do this all the time, okay? Total and totals, that makes total sense to me, okay? So, so for me... That works, okay? And this is very, 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 very common, okay? I program mostly in Python myself, so so I think total and totals, that for me is very Pythonic in quotes. Uh, for C++, they're saying don't do it. I disagree, okay? But, all right. So, that's one man's opinion. He wrote a book, right? So, so uh, okay, so a much... A great book, but a book nonetheless. Okay, so a much better set of names is ent enter total all total. Okay. Entry total, all total. I'll give it to him. That's probably a better name. Um, he likes the underscores as well. All right. Okay. Variable declaration defines the name of the variable. It defines the type of the variable. Uh, it gives the programmer a description of the variable. Okay. So declaration format, type, then name. Okay. So we have int answer. So we have a variable named answer that can only hold integers. Okay. This is the number one place the beginning programmers get fouled up. Okay, type and variable. Every function is going to return a type. You have to know what type it's returning so you can have a variable ready to hold the value. Okay, you have to understand what the type is of all the information that you pass back and forth. All right, if you don't know what the type is, you're going to guess wrong, right? It's like a one in, you know, 10 chance that you're going to be right. Okay, you have to know what the type is of the variable. You have to know what type of the information you're returning. So here we have Look at it with me. Int answer means a variable named answer that can hold only hold integers. Only. You can't store a character. You can't store a boolean. You cannot store a. There's a number. Just a number. It's an integer. It's not even a decimal. Yeah. You can't store one point two in in this in answer. You can only store one. You can store zero. You can store three. You can store six. I could go on and on. You can store 101. You can store negative, so right? No, you can't. Because integer is negative. You can store negatives. If it's signed, if it's signed in error, which is true here. I'm going to go out on a limb. 
you're testing me. You're testing my knowledge of C++ by asking if you can score a negative. And I'm going to say, yes, you can. Okay. Well, we'll find Thank out. you. We'll find out, won't we? Okay, yes. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah, there, you there. Go. oh, I was right. Okay, so integers. Here we have it. Integers. There we go. Negative 222. He went on and on with his integers. They're practically infinite. Okay, the integers. Like, like numbers are. <laughs> I don't know, you have to have some mathematician if they're infinite. I'm not going to go on that one. Okay, no, not integers. Okay, these are not integers, they're decimals, right? Okay, so int name, int name, comment, that's a declaration, okay? Oftentimes, you'll see people go int name equals six, okay? That's two things. Int name is the declaration. Int name equals six is declaration and initialization, okay? So... That's two things. Most of the time, you just want to declare it on one line for simplicity's sake. In an 8-digit calculator, you can only use the numbers nine, nine, this number to this number. Enters have similar limitations. On most, okay, then again, here saying most machines are 32 bits, not anymore. Most machines now are 64 bits, providing a range of this number to this number. New 64-bit machines have, have four-byte integers, which means they're larger, right? To be honest with you, if you're using a number this big, you're not going to be using integers. You're probably never going to run into this value because at that point, if you're doing calculations that require numbers this large, you're probably going to be using decimals at that point anyways. All right. So, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay. Here's a really great graphic. All right. In answer, a place to put our results. Answer equals one plus two um, times four. We get the answer of 12. Notice that our, our, our equal sign is different than math, right? Our equal sign, it's really important to understand. An equal sign does not say two things are equal. This is not saying answer is equal to 12. It's an assignment. It's, it's not is answer equal to 12. It's answer is equal to 12. Okay? It's an assignment. We just put 12 in the box named answer. Yes? Is, if the, I feel like you would be using the program you to carry out calculations, so... Why would you give it an answer? Like most of the time, what you're wanting from it is an answer. Uh, okay, we're naming the variable answer. We're storing it's give this this right here on the right. It's already a twelve. You can think of it as a twelve. Okay, it's just another name for twelve, right? I mean, in math, that's basically what you're doing, right? You're just writing equivalent statements again and again and again. I mean, that's basically math, right? So. I'm, I'm, I'm reducing the entire, entire thing to one sentence. Yeah, it's basically writing equivalent statements, right? Like this is the, it's just writing the same thing again and again. So, so this is already 12 on the right hand side. And then we're storing it in a variable called answer to do something with it. Uh, and okay. Then, and then if you're like writing another string and you use the variable answer, it'll use. Right. You could say then answer two equals answer times answer because answer is now a 12. And then answer two would be like 144. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, it would be 144, right? 12 times 12. Okay, so this, this graphic is a really great. So we have a box. The variable is the box. The name on the box is answer, and we're putting a 12 into the box. Okay, that's basically, that's a really great example of what a variable is. Okay, classic example. Okay, assignment. Okay, so we have our term is three times five, right? We have our, our kind of boilerplate stuff, uh, stuff up here, include IO stream, which is how we get our standard out. Standard C out, right? And then we declare a term. Uh, we have int main, right? That's our main function. Term equals three times five. So now term now has a 15 stored in it. Twice term is two times term. It's three term is three times term. Okay, notice that we can then use term just like you were talking about uh, as the number that we stored in it. Okay, the two things are kind of the same thing at that point. <clears throat> okay. Floating point numbers. Floating point numbers are also called real numbers, contain a decimal point. Examples 5.5, 8.3, negative 12.6. 5.0 is a floating point number, 5 is an integer. This trips everyone up. If everyone could look at the board, if you're not looking up there now, please read this note right here. 5.0 is a floating point, 5 is an integer. Okay? So if you're declaring, if you're initializing a floating point variable, you cannot initialize it with a 5. It will give you an error. You have to initialize it with a 5.0. That is a floating point number. A 5 is not. Okay? That trips everybody up. Okay? Yeah. Okay, floating point number is just another name for a decimal. It is possible to, you know, in the sim 
simplistically. Okay. It is possible to omit the leading or trailing zero and floating point numbers. For example, five point is the same as 5.0 and 0.2 is the same as 0.2. However, adding the extra zero makes obvious to you that you are using floating point numbers. For example, five point floating point looks like five integer. 5.0 does not look like five. Exponent notation for floating point numbers, E plus or minus exponent. So for example, 1.2 E 34 is short for shorthand for 1.2 times 1,034. Okay, you can experiment with that to figure it out. Okay, so an integer div divide truncates to nine divided by ten. Floating point divide does not. Floating point divide does not. Nine point nineteen point zero divided by ten point zero is one point nine. A divide is floating point, either operand is floating point number. Okay, so if you divide 1 divided by, or sorry, if you divide 10 divided by 2.0, the result is 5.0, which is a floating point number. Okay, so any division that uses a floating point becomes a floating point number. Okay, um, so look at the result. So if we have an integer, if we say like int, int number equals 19 divided by 10, the result is going to be 1. Okay, that's going to seriously mess you up, right? So, my opinion in modern machine guys, just use floating point numbers all the time. That's my opinion, okay, because it, it reduces a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. I mean, if you really, really are in a low memory system, you really have to worry about uh, memory allocation, right? Like, yeah, exa if you, yeah, exactly. To make, if you're using like some kind of like embedded board or something that has almost no no memory, then you have to start worrying about this stuff. If you're working on a regular modern computer, I don't see I don't see the point. To be honest with you, now I'm probably going to be told that I'm wrong, but but that's my opinion. Okay, so here it is an example: in integer floating float is floating. Okay, floating. So this, this shows you the result of, please go back and review this in detail. So this shows you the result of a bunch of different things. You should really understand that when you're using floating point versus integer, the results are going to be different, right? So an integer one divided by three, it's gonna be a zero, okay? Because it doesn't sort decimals. Anything less than one is a zero, all right? It doesn't round, all right? It just cuts off the decimal, that's it. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so what is the real, why is the result of this program zero? What can be done to fix it? Okay, so what is the what's the why is the result of this program zero? Because it's an integer, not a floating. Because what's an integer? The answer. Because it's answer was declared as a float. That's a float as a decimal. Oh, never mind that. Yes. That's exactly right. So when we answer equals one divided by three, that came back as an that 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 operation came back as an integer, which was then stored into the float. So it was already a zero when it was assigned to the value of float. Does that make sense? So we 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 divided two integers, and then that was a zero, and then we stored that into the variable, which was a float. So it like it automatically changed the type. It like up typed right or down typed or. There's a word for it. It it's not truncated. It's uh, it casted. It casted it as type a float when it, when then on the equal sign. Okay. Yes. Question, Kyle. Okay. What was the correct program look like? Okay. Let's. Uh, it would just be one point zero divided by three point zero. That's it. Oh, I. See. Yeah. So this right here, answer equals one divided by three, would be one point zero divided by three point zero. And then that thing in the quotes doesn't. The thing in the quotes, that's just a string that's being printed out. That's just that's just printing out a, a uh, bunch of characters. So these that this right here, the one and the three here are the same as like a T or a Q. It's like okay. it's the character one or three, not Bless. these things are just that's the way to like concatenate the string together for okay. yeah. Comprendo. Awesome. Okay. All right, character variables. So so in uh, character variables, we, in C, you had to become very familiar with character variables because there's no string objects. Lucky for you, there are string objects in, in C++. Um, so character variable, 
uh, and then comment. Characters enclosed in single quotes. Another thing that trips everybody up. Okay, seriously, because just a second ago, you were using double quotes for the C out, right? Okay, that's something you have to become familiar with because in a lot of programming languages, Python, JavaScript, Java, I'm not sure about. Um, but a lot of programming languages, it doesn't matter. They're interchangeable. C++, single quotes and double quotes are not interchangeable. Okay, so here on the character, character, you can't, characters are enclosed in single quotes, not in double quotes. Okay, the backslash is used to indicate special characters, which we'll get into later. Example, backslash N is the new line character. It advances the output to the next line. Okay, so um, when you're when you're printing things out to the screen, a lot of times you have hidden characters like carriage returns, new lines. There's lots of them. Okay, uh, backslash and then that character is the special character. You can look look up the whole list of special characters. Um, uh, yes. Okay. Usually we call that an escape, so an escape n. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Care one, care two, care three. A character stores a single letter or a single character, right? A character could be a three or a six, but it won't be, that's not a number at that point. It's just the character, right? Uh, it can store all kinds of different characters, right? Okay, so a character is a single letter. Wide character variables. Used for foreign languages that can't be represented using single characters. So W character variable. Okay. So wide character contains the form L and then single single uh, quote and then character. Okay. So center equals L, single quote, and then there's a Chinese character in there. Lucky for you, programming is really English centric. It's one of the advantages that we have. Okay. So... It's just good luck that you. Uh, uh, computing itself is just really English centric. I mean, it could not be. It could have been something else. I mean, it just it's you know it's just it's happenstance that, that it is. Okay, the Boolean type is next. Boolean's either true or false. Really straightforward. It's great. Other programming languages, T is sometimes capitalized. F is sometimes capitalized. Not true here. Okay, so in this case, we declare flag as a Boolean. So do we we declare it bool flag? And then flag equals true. Okay, it can only be true or false, not anything else. All right. The bool type is revealed is relatively new to C++, and some legacy macros exist within implementing bool type. You guys will never see this stuff because it's so old. Okay, but it's under its lowercase b o o l is boolean. Okay, and we have reached the end. Okay, guys. So good luck on chapter four. You guys are going to do great.